Breakfast uh, Central. Every year since 1992, October 10th is marked as World Mental Health Day to raise awareness about mental health. Challenges faced in accessing treatment as well as highlighting the progress made so far. Our conversations about anxiety, depression and other mental health challenges and conditions used to be otherwise uh, shrouded in secrecy. Today, even though it still faces some level of stigma, more people are talking about mental health and in so, uh, rather in so doing, uh, or doing so rather, breaking the stigma uh, surrounding it. Not only have mental health conditions been on the rise, the treatment gap for mental health conditions has also widened. The theme for World Mental Health Day 2022 is Make Mental Health and Well-Being for All a Global Priority. Now joining us from NC Research Desk is Babatunde Oguntime. Good morning, thanks for joining us. Good morning, thank you very much. Uh, now let, let's talk about the research aspect of it, you know, across Africa, across the continent. Um, like I mentioned, you know, it, it has become a more popular conversation. But why is it important, you know, and why is research on mental health, you know, becoming more important? And, um, you know, how has it helped? Thank you very much for having me. Um, these days, mental health uh, is basically about the psychological, emotional and the social aspect of it. Most people go through so many things without even knowing. Um, the mental health is basically different from what you have when it comes to physical health, where you see a wound and you can literally put a plaster on it. But mental health is different. It's only the person who is going through it that feels um, some of these things. And uh, it's very important, especially from childhood to adolescent to even uh, adulthood. And um, for over a long period of time, uh, People have been reacting to this, but in Africa, it has not really been a very... Most people feel in Africa it's a white man's uh, disease. But uh, recently, especially since we had um, the COVID-19 pandemic, a whole lot has changed. And for our research says that uh, more than 25%, uh, uh, there was a, an increase of about 25% prevalence of people who were having uh, mental issues from um, depression to anxiety. And if you look at it, um, there's a World Health Organization research that says, the World Health uh, WHO research that says one in eight people are mentally ill. And if you look at that, uh, for, for the world that has a population of about eight billion, that shows about one billion people have mental illness. And that's a very staggering, uh, you know, statistic. Yeah. So when you look at all this, you realize that a whole lot needs to be done, just like the theme for this year, a whole lot to be a lot of, a whole lot, of, so many things needs to be done. Countries, individuals, and public health uh, yeah. organizations need to put uh, all hands on deck to make sure that you, this. You just said about one, one billion people, you know, on the average, you know, might be suffering from mental health challenges. But when, you know, anyone hears that, you know, they, they because of the image that Africans and Nigerians have about mental health issues you know they imagine someone who's dirty and homeless and on the streets and some of all of that yeah, that's so let's true. talk about that perception you know and break that or break it down for people to understand uh, better you know that it doesn't always have to have that image or that look yes um especially i, I would like to uh, come down to africa this this is sort of stigma attached to mental health so people hardly discuss it and um, there is a base, basically a sort of rejection. There's more rejection than more acceptance of uh, um, be, uh, mental health situations. And um, this rejection has sort of put a lot of crisis on that field. That's why people are not, people are not, because when you don't talk about it, you, don't, you can't even profile solutions to it. And uh, if you look at it, um, the rejection are basically along uh, the social class. And these affect, uh, these uh, basically as a result of maybe occupational and age. But research says that even young people are more likely to have mental illness. Because if you look at it, uh, World Health Organization says in a recent research says about one out of seven youths, out of seven adolescents, that's between the ages of 10 and 19. One, of, one, to, one uh, out of seven of them are mentally ill. And uh, you see that most of them, like, most of the, like, um, like, 5% of that age group uh, experience um, what you call 
so I mean, they, they see so many, they go through so many things, like they are the ones who go through uh, peer group pressure and all that without even having someone to, unlike adults who can walk up to a psychotherapist and say, this is what is wrong with me. But kids hardly do that, especially when they are living in the house where the parents are not even accessible or the schools where their teachers are not accessible. So it's a very huge problem that we have there. All right, let's talk about how Africa can help tackle this, you know, mental health um, um, conversation. Uh, should it be more of fighting the stigma or it should be about investing um, in mental health uh, treatment and getting people to be more open to, uh, to, to receive treatment and speak about it? Mm, yeah, I think uh, it should be more of both. First thing, enlightenment. People should be made to realize that uh, when you have mental illness, it's not just uh, the people or who you see on the streets, very dirty and you get to looking. It's more than that. People go through so many things, so many challenges. Even people who you see every day in looking good go through so many issues. And uh, the way you dress doesn't really matter. On uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's a mental thing. So what we need to do, especially in this part of the world, is that we need to enlighten people more. Make people talk about it, because in some places in Africa, it still seems like a taboo to talk about this. Most people don't want to be related or to be associated with having somebody who is uh, mentally ill in their family. They don't want to talk about it. So people must be made to talk about these things. And by that way, we can break that cycle of you know, wanting to stay out of it. And then, aside that, um, the government needs to invest more in it. In Nigeria, for example, I want to take a case study of Nigeria with a population of about 200 million. We have less than 130 to 150 psychiatrists. That is not good enough. That's Those are things enough. we should look at and uh, I think with, uh, with time we'll be able to overcome some of these challenges. All right, thank you Babatunde Oguntime for stopping by and for sharing with us. Uh, exactly. Of course, you know, people say that um, um, surgery or medical surgery really is uh, um, a surgery on the body, you know, the one that we're very much aware of. But there's also the mental health you know and the conversations about mental health therapy and the likes which are surgical procedures on the mind and so to understand a little bit more of those technical details we're joined uh, by of course uh, a clinical psychologist olive has a lot of questions to ask all right thank you very much osalge for that yes let's delve further to talk about mental health day and the awareness especially in 2022 we're now joined by Dr. Oyedikachi Ekwerike, a clinical psychologist, mental health expert, and the founder of Postpartum Support Network Africa, the first NGO in Africa to help and support parents who are dealing with mental health in Nigeria, especially as regards postpartum depression. Good morning, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Olive. Glad to be here. I think the, the first way to start off would be to talk about, of course, Africa's receptiveness towards mental health in Nigeria. Let's talk about it in 2022, rather, in Africa. How would you rate the receptiveness of Africa towards mental health conversations? The awareness is, you know, growing. More and more young people are beginning to realize that it's important for them to care for their mental health. You know, a lot of work is being done to create awareness, specifically on social media. But, you know, a bulk of this awareness is done on social media. What that means, though, is that we have rural people in rural communities who have no access to information about mental health care. So more still, more still needs to be done in terms of, like, raising awareness and getting into these communities to not only teach them about mental illnesses and how to take care of their mental health, but also to improve access to mental health care for them. Now, the theme for this year is, of course, making mental health a global priority. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about why we need to make, you know, why the conversation about mental health is as important as is. What we find is that some people sort of belittle conversations about mental health, especially when people say, I mean, in organizations we hear when people say, well, I need to take some time off mental health, but some bosses, some employers, some people in general don't understand why this is important. So why is conversation about mental health important and how can we make it a global priority? So for starters, like depression, which is one of the most um, prevalent mental illnesses, is the leading cause of disability worldwide. What that means is there are more people who struggle with depression than there are people who struggle with heart attack and heart diseases. So it's, it's, a, it's an epidemic. I, I, I used to say like, Depression is a pandemic that we were struggling with before COVID came into the picture. So attention needs to be given to it. More importantly, in Africa today, 34,000 people die each year as a result of suicide. So we're losing a lot of people to, this, uh, to, to mental illnesses. So we must turn attention to it um, as quickly as possible. Now let's talk about barriers. There are hmm. several barriers, of course, that are impeding on the access to mental health. What are some of these barriers in Africa? I mean, one would be like our cultural beliefs, 
you know, so a lot of people still see mental illnesses as a white man's illness. They still see mental illnesses as a spiritual problem. We don't pack that, you know, as we continue this conversation. We also have lack of funding, you know. Think about Nigeria as, as an example, 200 million people and very, very little access to mental health care. The government is not funding it. Our bills are outdated. So, you know, when we think about the policies, you know, in place for mental health on the continent, it's lacking. And so that's, that's, that's another barrier. There's shortage. In Nigeria, for example, for every five um, psychiatrists that's trained in this country, three leave the country to practice outside the country. I mean, we have brain drain in, in, in this sector and, no, and nobody's paying attention. So there's fire on the mountain, but nobody, nobody seems to be running. Um, so we have lack of access to mental health care, lack of practitioners, we have cultural beliefs that limit, limit us. These are three things that, you know, in a, in a, in a nutshell, um, prove to be a significant barrier, as well as cost. You know, considering the fact that we do not have a lot of psychiatrists and not a lot of psychologists, the cost of mental health care is really high. So it's not uncommon to hear people say things like, I cannot afford therapy because it's so expensive. Um, and so th those, are, those are some barriers to mental health, um, mental health care that currently exist in, in the continent. So now let's talk about some of the beliefs, you know, hmm. Let's debunk some of these myths that are surrounding mental mm -hmm. health. Which, or uh, what are some of the most common myths surrounding mental health? Help us debunk them this morning. I mean, particularly the one about mental illnesses being spiritual problems. It's laughable if it wasn't sad, you know. Um, so the, the belief that mental illnesses are spiritual problems is rooted in this African belief that anything that we do not understand can be explained away, you know, via spiritual means. So you see a lot of people taking their relatives and friends who are mentally ill to like spiritual leaders to pastors. You cannot pray away depression. You cannot pray away psychosis. Just the same way you cannot pray away cancer. You know, when, when, it, when a relative has cancer, the first thing you, you tell them is like, hey, have you seen a specialist? You don't tell them like, hey, have you prayed hard enough? So you take them to a specialist who then, you know, um, basically helps, helps them professionally. So the same thing must be done, the same approach must be taken when it comes to mental illnesses. When somebody struggles with depression, the first thing you should do is to encourage them to get professional help. The second challenge is that we, begin, we, we still see mental illnesses as a, as a Western problem, like only white people get to struggle with it. We hear things like black don't crack, and we shame our loved ones when they struggle with it, saying like, hey, you're probably very, feeling very comfortable now to be struggling with mental illnesses. So we must you know, begin to challenge that. Every time we hear people joke about that, challenge that in your own circles to say, no, Africans struggle with their mental health too. And it's okay to, to not be okay. It's okay to reach out to help when you struggle. Um, it, it does not make you um, a bad person when you struggle with your mental health. It does not mean that you're weak. Um, it does not mean that you know, God is no longer on your side. And all of these things that we continue to share, this, thick, um, this wrong beliefs, um, it, it makes it increasingly hard for people to reach out and get help. So those are, those are I think, those are the two top, you know, um, myths about mental illnesses that I, I feel we must continuously debunk. All right. So, so now let's talk about um, the most prevalent mental health illnesses. In the course of your practice, so far, what would you say is the most common and how can we deal with it? So depression and anxiety are two very, very common mental illnesses that you know, we, we tend to take for granted. So depression, for example, is a clinical disorder that's characterized by intense feeling of sadness, emptiness, lack of sex drive, lack of appetite, and you know, lacking interest in the things that you previously used to enjoy. So the thing about this is when you begin to notice the symptoms, because people think that sadness is normal, and we all get sad from time to time, people tend to ignore it. But depression is not just sadness, okay? It's sadness that you experience two weeks back to back and you cannot be explained. There's no reason, you, don't, you cannot point your fingers as to why you should feel sad. So two weeks? At least two weeks back to back, you feel this intense feeling of sadness. That's the first symptom, yeah? And you feel emptiness, like I mentioned. You feel like your life has no meaning and you, you lack interest in the things that you used to enjoy. Um, previously, maybe for example, you like to get makeup ma made up and do your hair, you have no interest in doing that again. You like to watch shows and you have no interest in doing that again. You have no appetite for food or you find yourself binge eating, like food is the only way you get some emotional relief. These are some symptoms that we must pay attention to where you start to have suicide ideation, thoughts about killing yourselves, killing yourself. This is something you, you must pay attention to. So when you, when you notice symptoms of depression like this, the first thing you need to do is to reach out for help, okay? And anxiety too is another silent killer. And anxiety literally is, you know, your mind in a constant state of worry. You're always in the future or in the past, never in the present. 
when you find yourself in a state like that where you, you, you cannot keep calm, you're always anxious, always worried, it's important to get help too. So these are two mental illnesses that I think people must pay attention to, that we must continue to screen even in our, in, in our tertiary health institutions. I don't, I don't see a reason why you go in for a headache and you, know, you don't get screened for depression, for example. We must screen for depression and anxiety as often as possible so, we must detect, so that we can detect them early and encourage people to get help and provide them, the, provide them the help that they need as soon as, as, as soon as possible because it's a silent killer and like I mentioned 34,000 people lose their lives to depression I mean to, to suicide which is a function of depression and other serious mental illnesses. You know before we you know, end this conversation let's talk a bit about uh, postpartum depression which is a conversation that the organization was the first in Africa to start up this conversation. Um, how would you, how prevalent would you say this is? And you know, there are conversations about postpartum depression being something that happens to just women, but from some of the conversations I've heard, men can also suffer postpartum depression. Can you please shed some light on this? So postpartum depression is actually more prevalent than we, we, we like to believe it is. You know, one in five women at least will struggle with depression after having a baby. Now it's almost counterintuitive, you know, a woman has had a baby, people expect her to be happy, but that's not always the case, you know. Some women become really sad, really depressed after having the baby. And like you said, men too struggle with postpartum depression. The presentation is just a bit different. So while women become more reserved and they become sad, men tend to demonstrate anger, more anxiety, more irritability. So if you're a new dad, you know, even if you're not a new dad or you're, you know, you're a parent and you just had a child and you find yourself struggling emotionally, get help. It's okay to not be okay. Reach out for support and there's this resources out there like my organization like you mentioned PS in Africa willing to like provide support pro bono without a charge for free. For free yeah. Wow thank you well done and, and as family members and friends of people who may or may not be struggling with depression how mm -hmm. can we support? I mean social support is crucial so one of the biggest prediction of, predictors of postpartum depression is having no social support. So family members can provide tangible support. So when a, a mother just had a baby, um, instead of asking her, did the baby sleep well? Is the baby okay? Provide more tangible support. Ask her, like, do you want ice cream? <laughs> you know, do you want food? Can I, can I come help you clean the house? Can I help you cook some, uh, cook some food? Uh, what, what else would you need me to help you do? So providing tangible support like that is, is imperative. But also creating space for them to share and be vulnerable with us, talking about how they feel emotionally about um, the baby they've just had and all of the struggles they've had is something that we must do, not to like condemn them and make them feel like they're weak or, or having some sort of um, personality flaw. But that's what we should be doing to provide like tangible support for moms and parents who've just had babies. Dr. Onye Dikachi Ekwereke, thank you very much for your time this morning on Breakfast Central and we urge... Me.